Hello. I'm very sorry not to be able to be with you today, but I'm sending this pre-recorded talk. So I'm going to share my screen, I hope. So I'm going to be talking, following on from Annie's talk, particularly about prenatal stress and effects on the child, the child's neurodevelopment, the implications for psychiatry, and possible evolutionary explanations. So there's a lot of evidence now that the mother's emotional state during pregnancy and in the early postnatal period can have a long-lasting effect on her child. This is what we call fetal programming, that the environment in the womb during different sensitive periods for specific outcomes can alter the development of the fetus with a long lasting effect on the child. The fact that it's fetal programming that the trajectory can be altered in the womb does not of course mean that it's set in stone and that um, interventions later can't help. For example, we know that sensitive early mothering, which helps attachment, can counteract some of what happens in the womb. But we now realize that the environment, we've always known that how we turned out depends on interaction of our genes and our environment. Our environment starts in utero, affects the development of the young child, the older child, and also the adult. The fetal brain is under construction and how it's constructed depends on the signals it receives from the mother. So I'm particularly interested in the long-term effects of prenatal stress, different forms of prenatal stress on neurodevelopment. There's a wide range of evidence that different forms of prenatal stress can be associated with an increased risk of changes in neurodevelopment and behavior. It's not just extreme <coughs> or toxic stress or a diagnosed mental illness, it's much more broad than that. So there's evidence that if the mother has symptoms of maternal anxiety and depression, even if she doesn't meet the threshold for a diagnosed mental illness, this can increase the risk for a child having neurodevelopmental problems. Even maternal daily hassles, pregnancy specific anxiety, some women are very anxious about the outcomes of their pregnancy. That has an effect, increases the risk of various neurodevelopmental problems for a child. Domestic abuse, from partner or family discord causes stress. Of course, distress caused by war, being a refugee, a lot of the problems going on in the world, external effects of gender have an effect. And experience of acute disasters, external disasters such as a freezing ice storm in Canada, hurricane or Louisiana, or 9-11 in New York. And just as there are a wide range of different sorts of stress, there's a wide range of effects it can have on the child. The child is at increased risk for having more anxiety and depression themselves, having behavioral problems, ADHD, conduct disorder, impaired cognitive development, sleep problems in infants, also neonatal behavior, babies are more difficult to sue. It's increased risk of being on the autistic spectrum and increased risk of schizophrenia but that's just associated with the very severe stress in the first trimester, when we know that the neurons are migrating to the final place of the brain, and we know that the schizophrenia is associated with that. We also, there's a lot of evidence that antenatal prenatal stress is an increased risk for an accelerated life history in the child. Everything is speeded up. There's reduced gestational age, it can be born earlier, there's increased risk of actual preterm delivery. Girls have an earlier manichae and newborns and later children have been shown to have a shorter telomere length, which is associated with a shorter lifespan. <clears throat> Some people have queried, there's a lot of evidence for these associations, but is it really causal? If the mother's anxious in pregnancy, maybe she has a genetic predisposition for anxiety, she's passing on to her child, and um, maybe um, she's also depressed or anxious postnatally, and it's the postnatal care that's having an effect. Well, we know that both genetics and postnatal care have a big effect on child outcome, but there's actually a lot of evidence now for a causal component for prenatal stress too. 
many animal studies have shown this. The natural disasters, the effects of natural disasters, such as the freezing ice storm in Canada, shows it's not just genetic. Population studies, which allow for a wide range of confounders, including postnatal maternal mood, and we have some understanding of the underlying mechanisms. We've done a lot of work with the population cohort ALSPAC, um, where we've looked at a lot of the confounding factors, and we still find a line for all the confounders we can think of, that if the mother is in the top 15% for anxiety, her child has about double the risk of a probable mental disorder at age 13. Um, the risk is increased from about nearly seven to about 12 and a half. And this is important. It shows that 90% of the children aren't affected, but a doubling of the risk is really important for um, public health and for the families involved. And the effects of prenatal and postnatal anxiety are rather similar in attitude. Um, for most of these outcomes, the effects are similar right through gestation, similar with anxiety and depression. It's certainly not just all happening in the first trimester. This is a recent study by a colleague of mine from Yale showing that prenatal anxiety accelerates the child epigenetic, epigenetic pediatric clock, that the children's pattern, child's pattern of, of epigenetics um, uh, changes with age. And if the mother was anxious in pregnancy, this pattern is speeded up both at age six and age 10. Uh, and that's been found with two different cohorts that's it, for babies. So there are many different aspects of prenatal stress, which I think, as I'll come to in a minute, can be explained by evolutionary pressures. We're starting to understand a bit of how all this is happening, particularly cortisol with animal experiments. It's been shown that cortisol or um, its analogs in rodents um, are implicated. In humans, we've found that the placenta becomes more leaky, allows more cortisol to pass through if the mother is stressed, and that this affects the development of the fetal brain. So that, that there's a down regulation of the enzyme in the placenta that breaks down cortisol if the mother is stressed or anxious, allows more cortisol to pass through to the fetus. And we've, we're using amniotic fluid, we've shown that the higher the exposure of cortisol, in the amniotic fluid, there's an inverse relation with um, cognitive development. With a, a, a functional MRI study, we've shown that there's an altered pattern of responses in the brain associated with higher levels of cortisol in the amniotic fluid. And the patterns observed are associated with reduced attention and increased anxiety, which are two of the most common features found on the child after prenatal stress. So it's definitely so that some children are affected, not others. They're affected in different ways. We wondered if this was partly explained at least by gene environment interactions. And again, using the big ALSPAC cohort, we found that that's so. We all have one of these three forms of the um, COMT gene that breaks down adrenaline or adrenaline and dopamine. If the child has this form of the gene and the mother was anxious during pregnancy, they do less well, significantly less well, in a working memory test at age eight. If they have one of these two forms of the gene, they're resilient. And that's the gene also, this form of the gene also makes them more susceptibility to developing. ADHD. So why is all this happening? What are the possible evolutionary explanations for these effects of prenatal stress on neurodevelopment? Well, a part of understanding this is to understand the concept of the predictive adaptive response is described by Gluckman and Hansen in a book called The Fetal Matrix, 
and that they say the processes by which environmental interactions in early development lead to changes in physiological and physical development, not primarily for immediate advantage, but for expected future advantage in a particular predicted adult environment. And I think that a lot of the changes we find in neurodevelopment in the children after prenatal stress can be understood in this framework. For our ancestors and for animals, if the mother felt stressed while she was pregnant, it was very likely there was real danger about predators, for example. And that a lot of the adaptations and what we see happening in the child might be of adaptive value in the presence of real danger. Uh, for example, if a, a, a person is more anxious or fear, fearful, they're much more vigilant. Um, they're always looking around. And so they'll spot danger more quickly and be able to take avoidant action. Also, ADHD, if people are distracted by a slight noise, maybe a rustle in the undergrowth. Um, in our society, that's very maladaptive. If you're trying to do an exam, it doesn't help to be distracted. But if you're readily distracted by signals that might suggest real danger in the environment, that could be adaptive and help to survive. So I think that what we think of as maladaptive, a lot of the neurodevelopmental and um, child pathology could be understood better as adaptive in a very dangerous environment, which has made the mother feel stressed. Um, other other um, effects that we see in the child, being more impulsive, they might be more willing to explore near, new environments, be willing to go and find somewhere that actually is safer to live in. Contact disorder, being willing to break rules, again, could be adaptive and being aggressive, which a lot of these children are associated with conduct disorder. Lashing out, um, again, is very maladaptive in our environment, but um, if there's real danger about immediate lashing out, responding to danger could help save lives. Uh, being on the autistic spectrum, a lot of neurodiversity, seeing things in a different way, again, could be adaptive to have some people in the community who are like this could be adaptive. And the cognitive deficits, as we measure them in themselves, aren't helpful, but could be side effects of ADHD or being on the autistic spectrum. So a lot of the things that we see as maladaptive, we see as child neurodevelopment problems can be explained as being adaptive in a really dangerous environment, which are ancestors or animals, because all these mechanisms have been found in animals too, in mammals anyway, um, could be adaptive. Other findings explained by the evolutionary perspective are sex differences. Uh, females, I haven't mentioned this in the earlier part, but Females are much, and we, and we know generally, females are much more likely to be anxious, males to be aggressive. But females stay to look after their offspring. It helps them to be more vigilant, to be scanning the environment, looking for danger. Whereas the males who go out and explore and fight, it's helpful for them to be more aggressive and to more quickly reactive. Then, a lot of these effects of stress have been found to have a dose response curve. And again, that can be explained in evolutionary terms, that the higher the level of the stress in the environment, the more it's helpful to have more children affected in the ways I've described. And it's very clear from all the evidence that children aren't all affected in the same way. Some get ADHD, some are more likely to be anxious, some are more likely to be on the autistic spectrum. Some, most aren't affected at all. But we know it's a crucial part of um, a, a whole Darwinian theory in evolution that we're not all affected in the same way, that it, it helps to have 
different people affected in different ways, and that's certainly what we find with this too. Then the other, apart from the neurodevelopmental effects of prenatal stress, the other major effect that's been found in many studies is an acceleration of the life history. There's reduced gestational age, there's more preterm deliveries, early menarche in girls, shorter telomere length, which might be living less long altogether, and an accelerated pediatric clock. And all this speeded up helps to earlier reproduction. And as Annie discussed, that a speeded up life history, where there's a lot of danger around, could again be of evolutionary benefit, more chance for the selfish gene to reproduce. So all, both the neurodevelopmental effects and the accelerated life history make more sense if we think in evolutionary terms. So I think all this has quite a lot of implications for psychiatrists, particularly the pediatric psychiatrists, people looking after children. A child's psychiatric problems may have particular characteristics if the mother was stressed during pregnancy. There hasn't been very much research into this, but we know that all these terms, ADHD, anxiety, actually have many facets and different children uh, show different degrees of one facet or another. And I think if one is helping a child who is, say, particularly anxious, it might be, be of interest to take a, 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 a taking their history to explore whether the mother was anxious in pregnancy and then to see if the child particularly has problems with more vigilance, more scanning as their type of anxiety. We, we, we don't know that. This is really just a suggestion and more research is needed. But I think the more we might divide children whose mothers have had stressful pregnancy and see what the exact characteristics of their particular form of problem is, we might have better understanding and have more um, different ideas for different forms of treatment. And the most major implication actually is that we need to all do more to reduce stress and anxiety and depression in pregnant women. Um, at the moment in obstetric care, psychiatry is rather neglected. It's getting much better. There's much more awareness of this, but we know that about 15% of women have levels of anxiety or depression during pregnancy of a degree which increases the risk for their child outcome. And we certainly aren't providing help for 15% of pregnant women at the moment. So we calculated that the attributable load of neurodevelopmental problems in the child due to prenatal stress is about 10 to 15%. So that and there are many other uh, genetic, postnatal care, other environmental things that um, can affect these outcomes in the child. But if we can reduce the stress, anxiety, depression in pregnant women, we should actually reduce some of this occurring in our children in the first place. And I think there's a potential to reduce the number of affected children in the UK by about 100,000 to 150,000. So, to say again, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I think it's really interesting to think about the evolutionary perspectives that can give us more understanding of psychiatry and why particular disorders have persisted in our population, even though we know that some people with these disorders actually have fewer children, but there may well be strong evolutionary reasons why they've persisted. Thank you.